here, continue to find your place there. This past year is an accumulation of decisions that you made up to that point. A lot of times we look at life and we think that life just happened, but the truth about it is, is life didn't just happen. We made decisions that produced the result of what was taking place. You know, it's kind of like whenever you say to someone else, I don't know why my kid's talking back, but they look and be like, because you've been letting them talk back for the last five years. And then all of a sudden we see it and we get surprised about it. Like, I don't know why this is happening. We get, you know, someone will say, I'm just so tired. I'm so tired. I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I just don't have any energy, but they stay up till three, four in the morning. They sleep two hours a night, but like, I don't know what's wrong. Look, the system will produce what it's set up to produce. If you wonder why you're living or struggling with impure things, or so it's because of the decisions, the accumulation of decisions you're making in an everyday part of your life. You know, overcoming what the enemy's trying to destroy you with isn't as difficult as we make it. Do you know that whenever you pray and ask Jesus to deliver you from something, that he doesn't resist you and say, mm, that's on Wednesdays. I mean, this is Monday. You're asking me to deliver you from, from anger, and I do anger on Wednesdays. It's not something you have to schedule by email and ask him for an appointment in his appointment book. He's there, he's ready, and he's willing, and he's available, and he desires to deliver you. Yeah. Jesus doesn't sit at the right hand of God and say, live in bondage. No, but there's an intimacy. There's an enemy and an adversary that desires for us to live in bondage. And the decisions that we make will really kind of calculate how we will walk into this season of our life. Now, again, for a lot of you, maybe you just went from December to January, but then there's a lot of us that are saying, I want to set in the calendar that we base our year off of, I want to set and make this year different than the year before. I've seen some victories from the past year, but I want to see more. I want to see God do more. I want to believe God for the more. And we have to clearly see what we have to do to be able to receive the great things that God wants to do in our life. If God wants to bless you, if God wants to pour out his blessing on you, if God wants to, to give and God wants to show you, then we have to understand that in God's abundant grace and mercy of what he desires to do in our life, what is the response that we should have? It's to make decisions and to live by principle and not popularity. Just because something becomes culturally acceptable does not mean that it becomes biblically correct. So we have to make decisions based on everyday principles of the word of God of how we're going to live and how we're going to calculate this upcoming season of our life. I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter three, verse 13. He says, brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it, but this one thing I do, I forget what is behind and I press on toward what is ahead. Look, we talked about it last week again. I hate to be too, sound so repetitive in the beginning, but it's important that you understand there's a reason the rear view mirror is a lot smaller than the windshield. Don't live in your past. Live in what's ahead of you, but take care of what's available right now. Looking, I'm looking forward to the, my best days are not behind me. They are ahead of me. And God's favor isn't defined on what I'm doing. God's favor is defined on the approval of him in my life. Does he approve of me? Does he approve of, see, th that's the thing in ministry that gets so confusing for so many preachers is they think because they're having success in the eyes of people that God, see, if God anoints you, it doesn't mean God approves of you. There's a lot of things that people do that God is using because he loves the people, but he's not approving the person who's doing it. And then they end up with some kind of moral uh, infidelity or something like that. And it kind of crushes a lot of people. Can I tell you, I'm not looking for the success that men look. I want to have the approval and the anointing of God. And the approval with the anointing means that I'm not going to hurt people long term. And I believe that accumulatively, that's what we all desire in our families. We desire that in our friendships. We desire that in our workplaces. So forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. And the choices that we make, like whether I'm going to live in surrender or I'm going to live in control. You understand, you can't surrender and have complete control. There's these sayings of, God is my co-pilot. Well, if he's your co-pilot, then it's going to be a bumpy ride. But we live life that way. We have a map, we have a, we have a, a, a course that is chartered, and we're asking God, 
to bless what we're doing instead of looking at what God is doing and then becoming a part of that. That's the way we live. We have to be intentional. I'm going to have surrender over control. And look, some, I, see, when I said that, some of y'all got mad. Like, oh, you're going to say, I'm going to have to let go. I don't know who you think you are trying to tell me I'm going to let. Okay. Well, keep your little hands on it. And watch what happens for the rest of the year. Hold on to it. Don't just, just mm, choke it out and it'll die. I right, do that. Or you can surrender because you'll never understand the power of what's in your hand until you lay it at the foot of the cross and watch Jesus redeem it. It's an opportunity to live in surrender and not control. Discipline over regret. I don't know why. And this is a time of the year when, when so many people are, are talking about exercise and fitness. Can I tell you that I still ain't running? It's, it's, <laughs> it's one of those, I'd lied to myself at one part of my life. Like, I'm going to like it. I never did. And so I'm going to try to do something different. I, I'd rather just like get in one of those wooden boxes that makes you sweat doing nothing. <laughs> Lazy sweating. <laughs> discipline over regret. It takes discipline to get to some decisions that you're going to have. I mean, it's like we're going to, if you make a decision, we're going to have more family time. Okay. You're going to have more family time. But don't sign your kids up for seven different sports and think you're going to have more family time. Discipline over regret. And guess who steers the ship? Mom and dad. It's just out of my control. Okay. No, it's not. You make the decisions of what you want to see happen. Don't be disappointed in anybody else. It's nobody else's fault. Discipline. Choose discipline over regret. I look at it this way as we move into this year. It's like getting dressed. Now, for all of us, that means something completely different. Husbands, you know what I mean. Whenever you're going to go somewhere and you're picking out clothes. And she says, what's this look like? That looks good. You didn't even look because I'm sure it looks good because you're wearing it. I don't know. I just don't. I don't like the way... Brown shoes or the black shoes? I can't remember style. Used to you couldn't wear brown with black, and now you can wear brown. I don't even know what the style is. That's why I don't care about style. I want consistency. <laughs> I would wear the same thing every day if it didn't start stinking. Sometimes, this is a shame, but if confession is good for the soul, there are times that I will come into, uh, I'll come into work, and if it was a day where I'll go, <laughs> I'll tell April, I was like, I'm wearing the same thing tomorrow, and I'm going to see if anybody has the courage to say, did you wear that yesterday? So I want to know if the people around me love me enough to say something. <laughs> so by the third day, nobody said anything. <laughs> but I'm sure they said something. They used to say it in my face. You know, it's the... <laughs> There's the idea of... Getting dressed is kind of like, I, I, I've got, I got some faithful clothes, you know? I mean, I, when I like something, I like something. I'm going to wear it all the time. Not the same for some people. It's got to, I got to get this. This has to go together. And so it's completely different for each person. But nonetheless, all of us have to get dressed, or we should, <laughs> when we go somewhere. It's, it's a decision that you make when you Put it's it, for some people getting dressed is harder than others because there's so many decisions. For me, I'm like, what is what do I not have to iron and and what's clean? It's real simple, but it's the everyday decisions that we make that will make the living it out more of a reality. Here's what Colossians three says when Paul was writing to the church of Colossae and he says to them, "You used to walk in these ways." In the life you once lived. He's saying to them, look, you have died to yourself and now you live in Christ. And the things, the immorality that you used to live on, now you've died to that. It says put off. It means literally in the Greek, it means like taking off an old shirt, an old dirty shirt. It means take it and throw it off. 
Don't pick it back up and wear that stinky thing again. He's saying because you are a new person, a new creation in Christ. And this is repetitive of the, the verbiage that Paul uses through the New Testament of the epistles that he has written. It's this, you know, the old is gone and the new has come. You are now a new creation. Old things have passed. Live this new life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is no new verbiage for Paul, but he's telling this church in Colossae this because it's an, it's an out offspring of the church of Ephesus. And now he's writing to them because of some confusion that has happened there. He's trying to teach them the very basics of how to live a Christian life because there are these teachers in the area that are trying to teach them that yes, you have some of it right, but there's, if you knew as much as me, they put this mysticism to it, that there's a deeper knowledge. And if you can know Christ, like they know Christ, then you would receive. But as long as they can keep you limited, Okay. And, and Paul is saying, look, you've come to Christ as a new creature. Die to the old things. I'm going to make this as simple as I can make it for you. This is repetitive language throughout the New Testament as well. The apostle James said to the Jerusalem council, he said, guys, let's not make it hard for Gentiles to come to Christ. You see, and look, the American church can do it at times. We want, instead of getting people to fall in love with Jesus, we want them to accept our rules before they fall in love with Jesus. But all that does is clean them up from the outside in. What has to happen is to clean, is let the Lord clean them from the inside out. Because when the Holy Spirit convicts and the Holy Spirit draws and the Holy Spirit speaks to someone, then I've learned this, that it's a lot better than rules you can make up and hand to somebody. All right, so there's, he's trying to teach them. He says, look, put... He says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Now, he tells them, you must rid yourselves of all such things. Rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger. Now, this is for people watching online and your friends that are not here. All right, you're going to want to keep up with this so you can tell them what I said today. Anger. Rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. They're talking about getting dressed, okay? Paul said, you used to live in these immoral ways. Now you put on the newness of Christ and you stop doing these things. Why? Because sometimes people just need a little bit of instruction. I can promise you that when someone struggles with anger, their desire is not to have anger. When someone has a fit of rage, you're like, man, I can't. They're not getting up in the morning and going, man, I just, mm, I can't wait to blow up on somebody. I don't think they do. I'm talking about the person who wants to love Jesus, okay? Like, man, I can't wait to make somebody, I don't, I don't want to roll some heads today. I want to. He says, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things such as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. You'd be like, who made them words dirty? Culture did. Stop saying them. It's, I, I love, this is one of my, like, as, as a brand new Christian for me, whenever I came to Christ, I just started in the Gospel of Matthew, and I read all the way through. And you're, this is before I went to Bible college, before I'd studied the Pauline epistles. I was just reading at face value, not even understanding how to study the Word. So when it said it, I just did it. In Matthew, when it says, if you look in your eyes, and you're, you lust in your eyes, your heart, you commit adultery. So what I do? I just quit looking. And like, you just might have to walk like this for a little bit. You know, I just it said if you can't keep your right eye, poke it out. You right, I'm like, man, I'm, I ain't gonna be able to see. I had no hands. It's gonna be, you know. It's but he was saying you can control what you look at, what you touch. You can control these things. And so when I get to these these very uh, simple informational texts like this, it becomes like, oh, man, because I've seen so many different opinions on these such things. But you like, well, what does the Greek really mean? in those words that are defined. Is it the same language of what, well, I'm glad you asked. Because anger is a chronic attitude of smoldering hatred. You ever just been around people, they just mad all the time? I don't understand this. I don't understand how a person can be in love with Jesus and mad all the time. Man, I just, and no one goes, I want to be just like them. 
I see that hatred. I see that anger. Mm, more like you, Lord. That's not how it goes. Look at rage. See, anger is a chronic attitude, and rage is an acute outburst. Kind of like road rage. Act right while you're driving. Act right. With, yesterday, look, I drove a lot yesterday, but after I'd driven a lot, so I, I try to do very well on the road, but we had to stop somewhere before we went to an appointment. We drove back, got up early in the morning and drove back all day. And I had one item. It was an energy drink. You'd be like, don't be judging me. I just drank because I was tired. And, and uh, I got one energy drink. And I get in this line at Publix that says 10 items or less. And the lady in front of me has a buggy full of stuff. And I want to go to the next line of 10 items or less. And the same, her sister is over there. <laughs> I did good on the road. But the devil like to got me at Publix. Yeah, because I got one thing I want to buy. And they can't read. And I feel like they're without excuse because we spend a lot of money in public education so that somebody can read the 10 items or less. But I didn't act out. I held it together. I didn't even look ugly at them. But I do find myself trying to figure out what to do in those moments whenever they pull out coupons after they're in the wrong line. I'm like, oh, did you take this off? I have this. To you. Whew. Oh, I just love you, Lord. You're so good. Touch the blinded eyes, Jesus. Rage or acute outburst. He says, malice. Like, well, I don't really struggle with malice. I mean, that's kind of a... That's the vice that lies below anger and rage. It's the root. It's the root. What's in you? What is this? You don't want to see somebody else win because you feel like you've been pushed down your whole life. You see, look, parents do this a lot with their kids. April was in charge. She ran the nursery of one of the churches we were on staff at years ago. And her little kid was maybe two years old or a little younger than that. And and I guess it was getting bullied in the nursery. I don't even know if kids know how to bully. Maybe they do. Maybe they took a toy or something. But it's not like a, a planned strategy. And the parents said, I'm dropping you off today. Punk another kid out. You know, it's not how, it's not normally how that goes. And she sets up a meeting and she goes through this big deal. Maybe the, the kid wasn't even a, a, a year and a half old. She says, you know, I was pushed down my whole high school career. And I was like, whoa, whoa, hang on. If we're talking about babies and nursing, it nothing to do with you. This has nothing to do with how you were treated in high school. This has nothing to do with somebody didn't give you your chance. Somebody didn't see that you should have been a pro ball player. Somebody should have seen that ain't got nothing to do with you. This has to do with the situation there. But malice in your heart will make you act in ungodly ways because you think that the world's against you. Everybody's against me. Everybody, nobody wants me to. Can I tell you the enemy would love to continue to plant that seed that will distract and destroy you? Slander. This is railing or evil speaking. Filthy language is shameful or abrasive speech. All these things, he says, rid yourselves of it. Throw it off like a dirty shirt. And then in verse 9, he says this, do not lie to each other. That's a good thing, right? What if we just made a decision this year we're not going to lie to each other? Like Christians lie? Some do. Hey, did you call that person? Yeah, I, uh, uh, I have found that if you'll just stand on the ground and tell the truth, it works out a lot better. Since coming to Christ at 19 years of age, I watched my father his whole life have to lie one time after another because he was a con artist. Can I tell you, the American church is full of lying people. You're like this church, I don't know. I ain't caught most of you lying, but I mean, I'm not saying, but I can tell you I've been in church a pretty good bit now. Don't lie. Just tell the truth. It works out a lot better. You know, well, so-and-so did that. Just tell the truth. If someone says you said something, if someone asks you, if you said it, tell the truth. If someone comes to me and they say, Pastor, did you say? 
I'll tell the truth, even if I was wrong in what I said. Why? Because I've learned that people can handle the nasty truth a lot better than a beautiful lie. You just tell the truth. Tell the truth. Hey, do you have accountability in this area? Yeah, no. Just tell the truth. No, but how can I? Hey, have you done? No, but how can I? Are you doing? Yes, but I'm struggling in this area. Tell the truth. Don't lie to one another. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices. See, these are the things we're talking about and the choices that you make. You're getting dressed. You're having an opportunity in the decisions that you make of what you're going to allow to be a part of your life. Look, this is so practical today that anybody can do it. I believe that's how the gospel works. Anybody can do this. You just, you just have to make a decision what you're going to get dressed with. So I love what Paul does is he, he then turns the conversation from there because I love how he did well. And he's going to remove excuses from them. In verse 10, he says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of his creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. What is he saying? He said, all barriers are destroyed in Christ. All believers are truly created equal. What does that mean? There are no social separation in the kingdom of God. By race, by pay grade, by any of those things. That we don't play favorites in church. We treat everyone the same. When I went to Central Arkansas staff, one of the things that I learned there in the short season I was there, I really think was something that would shape the way that I do church the rest of my life. It's a simple statement that goes like this. It says, it says no problem will become bigger than the person, but the person will never become bigger than the principal. And that's how you treat everyone fair in spiritual unity. Like there may be a problem you have with someone, but that problem's not going to become bigger than who they are. But they're never going to become bigger than the principle of that thing. You're like, well, how does that work? It's whenever churches become, begin to mistreat the person who doesn't give as much as the other person. Or they say, we're not going to do this, but then they bend the rules for certain people. You understand what I'm saying? This is how you live according to the gospel. You just, you, you, there is no separate, is, is that everyone has a God-given right to know him. Yeah. In verse 12, it says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, this is getting dressed, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. The tender sympathy of heartfelt compassion, kindness, which is uh, benevolence in action, humility, which is a lowly attitude towards God, gentleness, which is a lowly attitude towards others, and patience, which is a self-restraint, a steady response in the face of being provoked. It's the last three ordered in Ephesus and Galatians that Paul speaks about. But then he says in verse 8, but you now must also, he, he, he says in verse 13, bear with each other. I love how he says this. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. This is repetitive language throughout the New Testament. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Today, What am I asking of you in the next few minutes? Just pay attention. This is what we're talking about today. Number one, look in the mirror. What are you wearing? What am I wearing? And I'm not talking about the physical. Obviously, you're like, oh, you're wearing that because you done gained. So I I wear it all. I'm talking about what are you wearing spiritually? Isn't it amazing whenever you wear something hideous and you're the only one that doesn't know it? 
He's like, all you had to do was take a look. All you have to do is take a look at what you got on. So if I look in the mirror and I'm like, man, you look miserable. Okay. I can change that. How do you change it? With the love of God and the peace of God. Man, I, I'm, I'm upset, I'm, I'm mad, I'm, I'm treating people wrong, I'm, I'm just frustrated all the time. All I have to do is look in the mirror. If I'm struggling with something in my life, all I have to do is look in the mirror because it should be obvious to us. You're like, well, pastor, what if you can't see it? I promise you, if you'll take a moment and look in the mirror and, not, and, and look at the reflection and go, Lord, what do you see in me that I should take off? And just say, hey, look, hang on to that hatred a little bit. Hang on to it. He's not going to do that. He's not going to give you an excuse for the things you're struggling with because he came to set you free. Yeah. Now, I see you live in bondage. Like, well, what does this have to do with 2020? Because, listen to me, Paul spends this time talking to the church. You want to know why? Because lost people can't receive this much instruction. They just need to get to Jesus first. And if you want to see the church transform, then the church needs to get a renewal of what it looks like in the mirror. So who am I talking? I'm talking today to people that claim to be a Christian. Do you really look like it? No, not in my judgment. When you look in the mirror, does what you say you believe reflect itself in what you see? Are you happy at the misfortune of someone else? Are you so angry all the time? Are you blowing your fuse? Over and over. Are you holding on to some malice because you feel like that there was something done to you and you just want to see, you want to see people getting it. You want to see somebody dealt with. You're going to see, nobody bullies anybody. You're going to, you got this malice in your heart that you want to see bad things happen. You wouldn't tell everybody that, but on the inside, you kind of smile a little at the misfortune of someone else that wronged you. Look in the mirror. Guess what's going to happen? You got to make that decision. Have you ever been wronged? Have you ever been hurt? Well, if you've been living for any amount of time, you have. And just because you have, you don't have to worry. God is, God is the one. God is the one that will deal with the ones that have offended you. You don't have to get even. And then whenever it happens, look, there's not been one person that's ever wronged me that whenever the manifestation of the evil in their life really became apparent and they became destructive, there's not been one time that they were destroyed. That I was like, there you go, Jesus. That's so good. Because here's what I believe. I believe that Jesus wanted to deliver them a million times in the privacy of their own life before the enemy exposed them publicly. So here's what I know, that whenever someone is exposed publicly, that that's because they ignore the grace and the mercy of God repetitively. The Lord wants to heal. He wants to save. He wants to correct. He wants to, he wants to admire. He, he wants to heal. He wants to, to, to make the wound a, a scar that is just a memory of what he's delivered you from. Look in the mirror. You've got to look in the mirror. I have to look in the mirror. Then clothe yourself. Choose what you're going to wear. Don't just... Like, well, I don't know what to put on. Put this verse on your bathroom mirror. Put it on the dash of your vehicle. Put it on an index card that every time you open your word that you see that. If you start every day with a verse that tells you what to put on, when he says, clothe yourself, clothe yourself. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make the choice. When you've had it up to here with somebody, be patient. Look in the mirror, then clothe yourselves. And then this is one we could probably spend every Sunday for the next year talking about, and that's forgiveness. He said, bear with one another, forgive one another as Christ forgave you. Look, there's nothing like coming off the holidays. It's a good opportunity to talk about that, right? Forgive. Don't carry those bricks for anybody else. You don't have to carry them. Let them go. Forgiveness isn't excusing what they've done. Forgiveness is saying, I'm not going to live in a prison because of what you did. 
I'm going to be free. I'm going to set you free. Go be you. I'm going to live in peace with God. Some of you carrying church hurt. You ain't getting in. You ain't plugging in. You're not stepping up. You're not serving. You're not because you got all this. Let it go. Guess what? Church is full of people. And what do people do sometimes? They hurt people. So Jesus didn't hurt you. Don't punish him with your lack of following through and obedience. Serve God. Love God. Love Jesus. Put on patience and humility. Forgive. Forgive. Cross this room. You got some, You might have to forgive your spouse today. Forgive. Bear with one another. Why? Because Paul understood that living this life with other people was going to be trying. It is a battle. And I love how he ended that passage. Be thankful. Three times he said it. He said, be thankful in 15, sing with gratitude in 16, and give thanks to God the Father in 17. That is perception. That's worship. I go, Pastor, how am I supposed to be thankful? Whenever my kids, be thankful you got a kid. How am I supposed to be thankful whenever, whenever my, my car's acting up and I ain't got the money? Be thankful and worship God that you have an opportunity to see him come through in the miraculous. It changes your life perception. Look in the mirror. Then get dressed. Forgive everybody. And then be thankful. Be thankful. Almost seven years ago at this church coming here as a new pastor I lost my ability to be thankful because I let all the other junk drown that out. Let me tell you what that does. It changes your perspective and no longer being grateful, you become a victim. And all that has to happen in being thankful is you just regain that awe and that wonder of who God is in your life and the opportunity he's given you. It's amazing how many times people that so call themselves Christians lose their ability to be thankful in the season of where they are. Like, well, pastor, I'm just I see this going on in my family. Then start giving thanks. Start thanking God for the miracle he's going to do. It'll change your perspective. It'll let you be able to make proclamations that we sang about. That you're able to appreciate and see God move. Come on, stand with me today. Stand with me across this room. You gotta look in the mirror. You gotta put, you gotta put the right things on. You gotta learn how to forgive. You gotta learn how to forgive. And you got to be thankful in all things. And whatever you do in word or deed, you do it in the name of Jesus. Whatever you do in word or deed, you do in the name of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I should have talked to you for just a few moments. I don't want you looking around because I don't want you to be distracted. I want you to do inventory. I want you to take a look. Figuratively, right now, I want you to take a look. As your eyes are closed, I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to ask the Lord, what do I have on? What is in me that you're not pleased with? What can I get rid of today? Then ask the Lord to clothe you, to clothe you with the attributes of which Paul listed in Colossians as his chosen people. Where you're struggling with hurt and pain, forgive. And then turn it to worship. And turn it to worship. This morning, you have an opportunity. These altars are open. I have prayer leaders that'll come down and they'll find their place among the front of this room, but maybe you want someone to pray with you about a specific need, or maybe this morning you just want to move out from where you're standing and you want to kneel in this altar and you just want to talk to Jesus for a moment. You have the opportunity to do that now. You can come, you can pray, you can talk to the Lord, you can do it where you're standing, you can kneel at the front of this room, but the most important thing is this, is that you will allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life in such an incredible way. 
Will you live in surrender and let go of control? Today, you say, maybe some of you are like, Pastor, I need to get my heart right with God, period. I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. You're in the right place. God has great things for you. God wants to do great things in you. But it starts with a surrender to Him. Today, if you want to give your heart to Jesus, all you have to do, all you have to do is pray a simple prayer. Lord, forgive me for I've sinned. Forgive me for everything I've done. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, you pray that simple prayer, you can be saved today. That is the launching pad of the destiny that God has for you. Put the old off and accept the new. Get dressed. If that's you today, we want to pray with you.